concludes the debate. The next item of business is a debate on motion 7584 in the name of Tom Arthur on the Edinburgh Bakers Widows Fund Bill. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Tom Arthur to speak and move the motion. Mr Arthur, six minutes please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to open the preliminary stage debate on the Edinburgh Bakers Widows Fund Bill. I would like to thank the other committee members, Alison Harris and Mary Fee, for their work in getting the bill to this stage. The Edinburgh Bakers Widows Fund Bill was introduced on 20th March 2017 and is being promoted by the trustees of the Widows Scheme. The overall objective of the bill, in essence, is to transfer the property and assets of the Widows Fund for the incorporation of bakers within the City of Edinburgh to a new charitable trust. The bill is the first private bill to be debated in the Chamber this session. It is not a controversial bill and no objections were received. The first thing that struck me about the bill was its title. I must admit to having been unfamiliar with the fund. The committee gained some insight into the history of the rules governing trading corporations in Edinburgh and how these now affect the trade scheme and now affect the trade some 200 years later. The incorporation of bakers of the City of Edinburgh was one of the trading corporations set up in the medieval times to regulate trade and, in 1803, a scheme was formed to provide the fund for bakers' widows. An Act of 1813 was passed authorising the scheme. The fund was established to provide financial support to the widows of contributing members. The last contribution to the fund was made back in 1981 and the last annuity paid under the scheme was in 1997. Since then, there have been no qualifying beneficiaries. During promoter's uh, evidence session to the committee on the 14th of June 2017, Lady Elizabeth Drummond explained that the question of introducing a private bill was raised a number of years ago. And she said, and I quote, we had this widow's fund for which the number of trustees was getting smaller. People were dying and there was nobody around to look after it. We saw that it would not be attractive or viable because of the very baroque entry requirements under the 1813 Act. You have to be male and under 45. And the benefits that might accrue to anyone were so vague and difficult to understand that it would, be not, it would not be an attractive vehicle for people to put their monies into. Consequently, presiding officer, the trustees were left with a fund of considerable value. However, it was simply not viable to promote the fund as, for example, an investment vehicle or annuity provider in competition with large, large pension providers. As, to quote the trustees, it would be trying to set up something in competition with, say, standard life. In 2013, the trustees decided that the scheme sh should not continue to operate in its current form and formally closed the scheme to new members. Currently, there are two wives of contributing members who could qualify in the future for annuities if they were widowed. The promoter has advised that the wives have agreed to accept a payment in lieu of potential future annuities to which they might have been entitled as widows in terms of the 1813 Act. In place of the fund, the trustees propose to set up a new charitable trust which would make use of the money that has been invested by supporting education and training and being promoted through the baking community. In response to the committee's queries about the purpose of the original fund being in line with those of the new charity, the promoters explained that, and I quote, we felt that that was the best way to go to make a genuinely good use of the assets in line with the spirit of the incorporation of bakers of the City of Edinburgh, so that we could get practical modern usage out of the money by promoting baking in the City of Edinburgh. That was one way to use the money, and creating a charitable vehicle was a way to encase it in a fully responsible mechanism that fits today's purpose. Presiding officer, the purposes of the new trust are the advancement of education by supporting education and training opportunities in baking, and the advancement of the arts, heritage, culture and science by providing public information and promoting an appreciation of local baking and the history of the baking trade, particularly in Edinburgh. The new trust, the incorporation of bakers of Edinburgh Charitable Trust, has been approved by the Office of the Scottish Charities Regulator. On the basis of the evidence received, the committee is satisfied that the 1813 Act has clearly become outdated and restrictive and that the trustees are correct in seeking a practical way of allowing the money in the fund to be redirected to a new set of objectives. Therefore, I move motion S5M 07584 that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Edinburgh Bakers Widow Fund Bill and that it should proceed as a private bill. Thank you, Mr Arthur. I now call Alison Harris, four minutes or thereabouts, please, Ms Harris. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I would like to thank the convener, Tom Arthur, for moving the motion. 
As Tom Arthur said, this is the first private bill to be debated in the Parliament this session, and as such, I thought the members may be interested to have some brief information about private bills more generally and why they are necessary. A private bill is introduced by an outside promoter and is about making specific changes to the law affecting the promoter, rather than about changing the public and general law. In practice, many private bills are about updating bits of private legislation that were passed a long time ago and have therefore become increasingly outdated. In today's case, the Act dates back to 1813. With private bills, there is always a right for the people or organisations who consider that a bill would be adversely affect their interests to formally object to the bill. However, in some cases, including the Edinburgh Bakers Widows Funds, which we are debating today, no such objections were received. Nevertheless, the Parliament has an obligation to scrutinise the bill and to satisfy itself that the changes to the law the promoter is seeking are reasonable and appropriate. I had no real awareness of private bills before being nominated for this committee, and I have found it an interesting insight into this little-known aspect of the Parliament's work. As with public bills, most of the detailed scrutiny of a private bill is undertaken by a committee. However, there are some important differences between the two types of committees, including the fact that the private bill committees are always ad hoc committees set up to scrutinise a particular bill. Any MSPs who have a close connection to the area affected by the bill are prevented from serving on the committee. The first stage of the private bill committee process is roughly equivalent to stage one of a public bill and is known as the pre preliminary stage. There are three aspects to the committee's task at the preliminary stage. Firstly, taking evidence and reaching a view on whether the general principles of the bill should be approved. Secondly, reaching a view on whether the bill should proceed as a private bill. And thirdly, giving preliminary sorry, giving preliminary consideration to any objections. If the Parliament approves the general principles of the bill and agrees it should proceed as a private bill, the bill goes on to the consideration stage, roughly equivalent to stage two of a public bill, and then on to the final stage where the Parliament debates whether the bill should be passed. In terms of the Edinburgh Baker's Widow Fund bill reaching the conclusion of the part preliminary stage, the committee is pleased to support the promoters of the bill in their quest to set up a charitable scheme which will not only make good use of the monies contained within the original Edinburgh Baker's Widows Fund, but should offer other benefits to the wider community in the future, as we've already heard in Tom Arthur's speech today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Mary Fee to close the debate, four minutes or thereabouts, Ms Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I move on to the main focus of my speech, can I take this opportunity to thank the clerks for the committee for the help and the support they have given not only to me, but also to my colleagues in the committee, Tom Arthur and Alison Harris. And the convener has outlined the objectives of the bill, in effect, the general principles. And in closing the debate, I will focus on the second part of the committee's role at preliminary stage, to satisfy itself that the bill should proceed as a private bill. And one of the aspects of this role is for the committee to satisfy itself as to the adequacy of accompanying documents to allow proper scrutiny of the bill. And the promoter's statement sets out how the promoter has notified and made information available to those likely to be affected. The explanatory notes, as with any public bill, aim to summarise objectively what each provision of the bill does. And finally, the promoter's memorandum must set out the objectives of the bill, whether alternative ways of meeting these objectives were considered, and if so, why the approach taken in the private bill was adopted, and the consultation which was undertaken. And I will not go into the detail of the committee's consideration of the explanatory notes and promoter's statement. Suffice to say that the committee was satisfied that the documents met the necessary requirements. However, I would like to say a bit more about the promoter's memorandum. And the convener, Tom Arthur, has already set out the objectives of the bill, and the committee was content that the mem memorandum set these out in adequate detail. In terms of alternative ways of meeting the bill's objectives, the trustees considered a number of options for transferring the assets and liabilities of the fund to a non-statutory charitable body and settled on a deed of trust, which would be regulated by the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, Oscar. 
And having agreed a structure, various mechanisms were then considered to affect the transfer to the new trust, including applying to the Court of Session to have the terms of the trust varied. And in this context, the committee noted that the new charity would have a significant change of purpose from providing financial support for widows to supporting education and training in relation to baking. And the committee was aware that the law recognises that arrangements for administering trusts, such as the Widows Fund, can become outdated over time and that it is possible for the courts to approve additional administrative powers, for example. However, in general, the courts will only agree to change the purposes of a trust to something closely aligned to the original purpose. And the promoter felt that none of the alternative remedies would enable the purpose of the trust to be changed and concluded that the most appropriate method of amending the objectives of the bill was to promote a private bill. In terms of consultation, the committee was content that adequate consultation had been carried out by the promoters with members of the incorporation, with the two wives of contributing members of the fund and with Oscar. And in conclusion, presiding officer, the committee was satisfied that the accompanying documents were fit for purpose and that overall the bill should proceed as a private bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reid. That concludes the debate on the Edinburgh Baker's Widows Fund Bill and it's now time to move on to the next item of business and for a few moments I'll pause to allow um, members to take their seats on the front benches.